I was sitting in my office when Jeff walked in and told me that the boss wanted to see me. I wondered what he needed. I gathered the documents into a folder and placed it on the shelf next to the hippopotamus figurine. Then, putting on my hat, I left. Richard's office was in the neighboring building. Climbing to the second floor, I knocked. Come in, a deep voice said. Opening the door, I saw a sturdy, sunburned man of about 55 with thick mustaches, dressed in a dark green ranger uniform. He held a sheet of paper and was reading what was written on it. Without looking up, he gestured to a chair. I waited for him to finish, looking around. Various awards hung on the wall and the shelves were filled with books on environmental conservation. Finally, the boss addressed me. Thomas, I have good news. We received a letter from the Maasai Mara Park. They agreed to the exchange program. So you can start preparing slowly. I need to gather some documents and get in touch with someone in Kenya who will help you settle in there. You can begin your medical examination tomorrow. Thank you, Richard, I replied excitedly. Sorry for bothering you with this trip. Don't mention it. I know you've been dreaming of going there for a long time. Plus, you'll gain experience and share it with us, so it's a win-win situation. Indeed, my lifelong dream has always been to go to Africa, to see lions and rhinos with my own eyes. You might ask why I couldn't make this trip on my own. The thing is, I've dedicated my whole life to working as a park ranger, and by the time I turned 45, I felt the desire not just to change the scenery but also to bring something new to my professional activities by working in such an exotic place. That's why an official request for an exchange between countries was needed. The next day, I underwent a medical examination and received the necessary vaccinations for the trip to Kenya. Then I started packing and preparing for the journey. The day of departure arrived. Boarding the plane in Seattle, I made a layover in Europe. After that, we flew to Nairobi. Finally, we were there. The beauty and grandeur of Africa unfolded before me through the airplane window. As soon as I stepped into the arrivals hall of the airport, my eyes immediately caught sight of a sign with my name on it. Behind it stood a man in a white shirt and light green trousers with red hair and blue eyes. He was my coordinator, Jack Stewart. After a brief greeting and exchange of pleasantries, he helped me with my luggage, and we headed to the car. Along the way, he began to tell me about Kenya, its rich history and amazing nature, also briefing me on local rules and traditions. The car sped us through the bustling streets of Nairobi, gradually giving way to open spaces where the true African savanna began. Jack pointed out various animals we encountered along the way, herds of antelopes, graceful giraffes, and even a few Maasai herding their cattle. But suddenly, a truck speeding with gravel passed us, raising a cloud of dust. Who were these reckless people? I asked Jack, but he said I would soon see for myself. We drove half a mile when a gathering of people and construction equipment appeared in the distance. Getting closer, I discovered that they were excavating here. What the hell were they digging something right in the middle of the national park? In addition to ordinary workers, there were armed men here who gave us unfriendly looks. Jack explained that a company had found rare earth metals here and bribed corrupt officials to allow the excavation. This caused public outcry, but the authorities didn't care. Jack also tried to intervene, but there was a lot of money involved, so no one could stop it. It was truly a sad sight. With their actions, these people were destroying the already fragile ecosystem of this place. I pulled out my camera to capture what was happening, but Jack asked me not to as it could be dangerous. After another four miles, we arrived in a small village where neat wooden houses stood. Five or six people who were park rangers greeted us. We got out of the car and Jack introduced me to them. None of them spoke English except for a 25-year-old guy named Macau. 
He was a cheerful and smart guy who immediately caught my eye. He was supposed to accompany and train me. After that, they led me to one of the houses. Inside, there was a small kitchen and bedroom. There was air conditioning here, which pleased me as I had already started to sweat on the way. Although I needed to start getting used to the local climate, so I mentally ordered myself to get it together. After unpacking my things, I said goodbye to Jack, who had to return to Nairobi. He told me to call him if anything happened, got into the car, and left. Macau brought groceries, saying I could cook something from them, and told me to rest because we would be getting up early tomorrow. I thanked him and made myself some scrambled eggs. Then, after taking a shower, I lay down as I was very tired. I woke up with the feeling that something small and alive was sliding over my skin. In the half-light of the room, I tried to understand if it was a dream, but a second light touch convinced me that I was fully awake, and this was really happening. Reaching out to my chest, I felt a snake, and with a sharp movement I threw it off screaming and ran out onto the street in just my underwear. Loud laughter erupted. My new colleagues laughed loudly, clutching their stomachs and pointing at me. I looked around bewildered, frightened by what had happened. Then Macau approached me, patted me on the shoulder and apologized, saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Harding. It's a local initiation ceremony, and besides, it can get boring here so the guys entertain themselves like this. And this snake isn't poisonous, so don't worry. He went into the house and pulled it out. It slid along his arm, wriggling and trying to escape. I looked at them, not knowing whether to cry or laugh. But looking at myself in the reflection in the window glass, unkempt and standing in just my underwear, I realized that it was indeed funny, and I laughed loudly along with the others. The guys approached me, patted me on the back, said something, and went about their business. I returned to the house, took a shower, and made myself breakfast. Soon, Macau came to me, bringing a uniform and local gear, including a rifle with a .375 H&H &H Magnum caliber. He explained to me that it could only be used in extreme cases. For deterring animals, he provided me with special sound grenades and showed me how to use them. After dressing up and gathering everything necessary, we headed out for my first assignment. Macau didn't tell me what it would be, and I was a bit nervous because of that. I asked him if he could tell me where we were going, but he just smiled, saying it was a secret. Ah, youth, I couldn't understand your whims as an old man. We left the settlement and headed into the tall grass. My guide walked, holding a long stick and pushing aside the stalks, trying not to make noise and looking around for possible encounters with wild animals. After walking half a mile, we came to a small clearing, where among small trees and rocks lay a huge gray animal with a horn on its head. Yes, it was a rhinoceros. I saw such an animal up close for the first time, and it was incredibly difficult to convey the feelings when you stand in front of something like that. It was like a scene from the Jurassic Park, where a sick triceratops lay on its side its belly rhythmically rising and falling. Only here lay a sick rhinoceros. Its eyes were looking at the sky as if waiting for its end. I noticed a treated wound on its leg, but apparently, first aid didn't help. Macau explained to me that it was attacked by lions, but since it was already old, it couldn't put up a strong resistance, resulting in getting injured. Although it managed to escape, its life was nearing its end. It was truly a difficult and sad sight. Soon scavengers should come here and start their feast. After inspecting it and realizing that it was getting worse and nothing could be done, we continued our journey. On the way, my companion began to tell me about the habits of these animals. I listened attentively, sometimes making voice recordings on a dictaphone. 
We walked about two more miles crossing the savanna without encountering any large animals. We met rodents and birds, trying not to disturb them. Macau named each species, briefly describing them. Suddenly he stopped, listening to the surrounding environment, then signaled to stop. I became alert and followed my colleague's gaze. In the grass ahead, I noticed a lurking lion. It was watching us in the pose of a stealthy hunter, seemingly ready to attack. Thank goodness Macau noticed it. I grabbed the rifle, preparing for a confrontation. But what happened next was the reason I came here. My colleague showed me how to handle such situations. With slow movements, so as not to provoke the predator, he raised his hands up, holding a stick in one of them, thus showing that he was huge and not worth messing with. And slowly started to retreat, I followed his example. So we walked, with my breath caught, and my heart pounding hard, and sweat pouring like a river. Damn, compared to our parks where you might occasionally encounter a bear. Here, danger lurked behind every bush. Finally, we retreated to a safe distance and were able to lower our hands. I exhaled and asked what happened. Macau scratched his head and said that due to some reasons, the habitat of lions and other animals had shifted. Usually they were not encountered here. He blamed it on the excavations that were being conducted nearby. We discussed with him how destructive human activity could be for nature. But in this case, we couldn't do anything. We decided to bypass this area and headed towards places adjacent to the settlements of the Maasai tribe. It took us several hours, and during lunch, we made a short stop, taking out dry rations from our backpacks. After eating and resting a bit, we continued our journey. On the way, we began to notice strange things. Animals and birds seemed to be troubled by something. There were even moments when they ran towards us, fleeing from something. This alarmed us, and we hastened our pace. We discovered the first sign of an impending catastrophe half a mile later. In the grass lay a torn apart lion. This shocked Macau, and I couldn't understand who could defeat the king of these lands. On the carcass, there were torn tracks and scratches from claws, so it couldn't have been an elephant or a rhinoceros. Was it another lion? Unlikely. I examined the paw and made sure that the sizes of the claws didn't match. The carcass was so mutilated that it seemed like a big lump of blood. The neck was bitten off and the tail was torn off. I asked my colleague who could have done this. He didn't answer, lost in thought. Soon he raised his gaze and I saw his frightened eyes. This couldn't be, he said these words and walked on, not explaining to me what was happening. I had no choice but to follow him. After walking another half mile, we found another bloody scene. This time it was a mother elephant and a calf. It was a heavy sight. The character of the wounds was similar. We examined the carcasses of the animals, then Macau called for backup on the radio. They were supposed to arrive in a few hours. We continued on our way, according to my companion, soon there should have been Maasai settlements. And indeed, after walking half a mile, small straw huts surrounded by a small fence of sticks appeared in the distance. Entering the settlement, we found no one. There was an inexplicable calmness around, as if time itself had frozen. Not a soul. It seemed that the inhabitants of the settlement had left it in a hurry. The fire in the hearths was still smoldering, and everyday items and decorations lay on the ground, creating the impression that their owners simply vanished suddenly. The livestock had also disappeared, leaving empty pens. We slowly made our way between the huts, trying to find any trace of life or an explanation for what had happened. Macau inspected the ground, 
looking for traces that could tell us the story of the recent escape. His face was tense, and I understood that such an event had an unusual character, even for him. At the edge of the settlement, we found several trampled items that seemed to have been thrown away in a hurry. This added mystique to the already mysterious atmosphere of the puzzle. We exchanged looks full of questions for which there were no answers yet. The silence of the settlement hung in the air like an invisible weight, making us feel like unwelcome witnesses to someone's untold tragedy. I asked him again what it could be. In response, he sighed tiredly, sat down on the grass, took out the radio, and transmitted our coordinates. Then he turned to me. Do you believe in spirits? I shook my head negatively. I thought so, he continued. How to say it in English? What happened here can't be explained by scientific methods. The spirit Kivuli Chamwezi has visited here which is the guardian of this area. According to legends, it doesn't harm animals and innocent people, so something might have angered or driven it mad. But what? Here he paused and soon continued. Perhaps it's because of the excavations nearby. I don't know. Let's wait for backup, and meanwhile, let's rest a bit. Then we'll continue our search. Maybe we'll find something here? Did I believe him? Of course not. Spirits and all that stuff had always been a fabrication to me. I knew that if an investigation were conducted now, there would be a scientific explanation for everything that was happening. So I wasn't as scared, but that didn't mean I wasn't cautious. Being dangerous to animals, it was dangerous to us as well, and we had to be prepared for it. As darkness gradually descended, we contacted our colleagues via radio again. But this time, there was no response. Macau repeatedly called them, but only silence answered. This greatly unsettled him. We decided to stay in the village since it was dangerous to walk through the savanna at night. To pass the time, we searched the village and its surroundings again and we were lucky. Next to the fence, we found a paw print. It was huge. Macaw couldn't identify who it belonged to, but upon examining it, I noticed a resemblance to the footprint of a North American wolf. It amazed me. Given the size of the paw, it couldn't be a real footprint since animals of such sizes didn't exist. It was unclear what was happening. Common sense struggled against something mystical. We gathered firewood for a fire and began to arrange our overnight stay. Pulling out food from our bags, we had dinner. Then, sitting by the fire, we started talking about our lives. Macau had five younger brothers he cared for. Since childhood, he loved animals, so his dream was to work in the park. He got a job here as an assistant when he was 15. Then, having learned the trade, he became a full-fledged ranger. I told him about my work in the States. He was very interested in how our work was organized. He especially wanted to see a bear. To my surprise, he had never seen snow in person. It seemed that things familiar to us were unusual for someone else, and learning about it was another plus of traveling. I asked him to tell me the legend about the spirit he mentioned. He agreed and began his story. Listening to such things by the campfire was very atmospheric, I must say. Here is a brief version of the legend. In ancient times, when the earth and the sky were just beginning to converse with each other, in the fertile lands where the Maasai Mara National Park now lies, there appeared a spirit known as Kivuli Chamwezi, or Lunar Shadow. Born from the first lunar eclipse, this spirit was endowed with the mission of protecting the wild nature and its treasures from any threats. The lunar shadow could take on many forms, from a gentle breeze to a mighty beast, but most often it appeared in the guise of a majestic animal, a guardian of the boundaries between worlds. 
It was said that during the full moon its power reached its peak, and no creature disrespecting the laws of nature could escape its gaze. Over time, the legend of Kivuli Chamwezi turned into a sacred narrative for the Maasai, reminding them that harmony between humans and nature was the key to the prosperity of the lands. And even now, when the moon rises over the vast expanses of the Maasai Mara, elders whisper prayers in the hope that the lunar shadow will continue its eternal vigil, protecting their home from all evil. The legend was beautiful, there's no denying it. I wanted to ask him to tell more, but then behind us, we heard a noise. Someone was pushing through the bushes, breaking everything in their path with noise. I thought it might be an elephant or a rhinoceros, but suddenly Macau grabbed my hand and dragged me into the nearest hut. I managed to pick up the gun and noise grenades, and in a moment we were inside. It was dark here. What's happening here? I asked. But my companion just pressed his finger to his lips, urging silence. Then he squatted down, peering out of the hiding place. I followed suit and started observing what would happen. The noise was getting closer, accompanied by a dull thud, as if something heavy was moving. For some reason, I began to feel scared. It was an irrational fear when you face something you can't resist, and a feeling of powerlessness overwhelms you. The unknown creature hadn't appeared yet, but it already affected my senses. I watched the campfire when, in its shadow, I saw the silhouette of something huge. The moon wasn't shining, and only the firelight fell on the surroundings. Therefore, it was difficult to see anything clearly. It moved around the campfire, but didn't enter its light, as if afraid of being seen. Suddenly, two fires lit up in the night. They burned red and were ten feet high. Oh God, whose eyes are those? I was terrified. I glanced at Macaw, who had no expression on his face. Then silence fell again. It seemed even the insects were scared and stopped their chirping. There was only the sound of someone's heavy breathing. It was so loud and unpleasant that it chilled me to the bone. Suddenly, silence again and a loud crack. The neighboring hut was torn apart into pieces, which scattered in different directions, raising dust. It was so unexpected that I recoiled in fear. Before I could recover, something flew into the fire, scattering burning branches around the village, setting fire to the straw roofs. Suddenly the familiar crashing sound echoed again and the neighboring house next to us shattered into pieces. Damn. At this rate, the one we're hiding in will be reduced to splinters too. I grabbed Macau's hand, who was in some primitive horror. Apparently fear of this creature was in their genes. And yes, now I believe in damn spirits. We headed to the wall opposite the entrance and punched a hole in it. After that, my new friend crawled out first, and I followed him after he squeezed through the thatch. We stealthily made our way through the burning settlement. Behind us, the crashing sound rang out again. I paled with horror. We almost got killed. We left the hut just in time. We hastened our pace, but from the shadow behind, I realized that the creature was heading in our direction and would soon catch up to us. It could have been our end, and we needed to do something. Then I felt a grenade on my belt. Pulling it out, I threw it as far as I could in the opposite direction. A moment later, there was a crash, and it seemed like it had veered away from us and headed there. In the flicker of the fire, I saw something covered in white fur. It was huge but I couldn't make out what it was exactly. We decided to run, reaching the fence. We kicked a hole in it and jumped into the darkness of the night. We ran for all we were worth, fear driving us on, and after some time we realized that we had distanced ourselves from the settlement by a considerable distance. Stopping and trying to catch our breath, we glanced back at the burning village. 
Something was moving among the fires. Then we realized it was the creature, leaping into the darkness and heading in our direction. What the hell does it want from us? Without hesitation, we ran again. The problem was that the moon was hidden behind clouds, which were a rarity at this time, and our path was covered in impenetrable darkness. Who or what we could encounter along the way during such an intense run? Only God could know. But luckily, we were fortunate. We ran for two or three miles without encountering any obstacles. Perhaps all the wildlife had been killed or simply scattered. I was heavily out of breath. Macau being younger found the run easier. I asked for a brief pause, and when I caught up to him, the ground suddenly gave way beneath us. We fell into a deep pit from which it was impossible to escape on our own. Fortunately, the bottom was soft soil, so upon landing, we fell on our feet before collapsing to the ground. I looked up, and my gaze fell upon a patch of sky, hidden behind clouds and framed by the edges of the pit. Suddenly, I heard heavy footsteps and something loomed over us. Its eyes glowed red, but the darkness prevented me from discerning it more clearly. It stared at us heavily breathing. I thought it was the end for us, but we couldn't give up. I grabbed the gun and took off the safety. Looking up, I was prepared for anything. But then the clouds unexpectedly cleared and the full moon illuminated the surroundings. Finally, I could see the creature in detail. It was a wolf, or rather a humanoid wolf. It stood on its hind legs with huge claws on its front legs. Its muzzle was elongated, its mouth filled with huge sharp teeth. It was a werewolf, the kind you see in movies or comics. It breathed heavily, drooling from its mouth. It stared at us intently. I, to be honest, was quite terrified. My hands trembled treacherously, hindering my aim. So we stood there for a minute, when, to our relief, the creature turned around and went off in an unknown direction. I breathed a sigh of relief and collapsed onto the ground. It was truly terrifying. Those occasional encounters with bears in our park seemed funny in comparison. After lying down and resting a bit, we started thinking about how to get out. The pit was deep, probably around 14 feet. Even standing on each other's shoulders, escaping was impossible. Macau tried to use the radio, but it remained silent. About an hour passed when we heard voices and noise from above. I stood up and started shouting, Hey, we're here. Help us, someone. Soon we saw silhouettes, and a flashlight beam hit us directly in the face, blinding us. After that, a ladder was dropped for us. When we climbed up, we were surrounded by armed men, but I paid no attention to that and said, Thank God, guys we thought we'd be stuck there forever. Then I saw a white man in front of me looking like a Spaniard holding a gun in his hands. After my words, he just smirked brazenly. Suddenly, I felt a blow to the back of my head, realizing that someone had hit me with the butt of a gun. I didn't have time to do anything as my vision darkened, and I lost consciousness. I woke up from jolts to my shoulder. Someone was trying to wake me up. With pain, I opened my eyes and saw that it was Macau. He realized I was okay, and relief showed on his face. I tried to understand where we were. It was a dark room, but I realized it was daytime because light was coming in through the cracks in the corners. I struggled to stand up and looked around. It was a hangar made of iron sheets. Inside it were huge cages, one of which we were in. I squinted. It was dimly lit, and in the neighboring cages I saw people dressed in traditional local clothes. 
Macau stood up next to me and explained that they were residents of the Maasai settlement. But what were they doing here? And who were those people who kidnapped us? Many questions swirled in my head. Soon a man came in. He was a black man dressed in hunting attire. He held a bucket from which steam was billowing. The prisoners crowded at the edge of the cage, sticking their hands through the gap, reaching for the plates. The man walked past, scooping up the gray liquid and pouring it into another vessel. The turn came to us. Macau found a couple of plates on the floor. After receiving the food, he handed me one of them. I tried to talk to the man, but he ignored me. So I looked at our lunch. It smelled awful, and I almost threw up. I set the plate aside. I had completely lost my appetite. People in the neighboring cages, however, were devouring it eagerly. I wondered how many of them were being held here and when I would become so hungry that I would do the same. I didn't know that. So the day passed, and in the evening they brought us the same food again, and I refused once more. I'm sorry, but I couldn't eat it yet. Fortunately, they gave us more or less clean water. The next morning, no one came to us. I felt terrible. I had to sleep on the bare floor, which was covered with a little straw. Besides, there were plenty of fleas and other parasites jumping around here. I began to ponder my fate, how an ordinary exchange trip turned into such unpleasantness. Then I glanced at my companion, who, unlike me, remained spirited and calm. And suddenly I felt ashamed that the young guy was handling the situation better than I was. I decided to pull myself together and it was not in vain. As armed men soon entered the room, opening the cages and leading people outside. They led us out to an open courtyard and as I looked around, I realized we were at the excavation site of a geological company. So that's where we ended up. But in reality, we could have been in even greater danger, as the local people were akin to bandits. They lined us up, and then a young man with an entourage came out and began shouting something, seemingly trying to find something out from them. Macau whispered to me quietly that this guy wants to know who the wolf is. What? I asked again. So the werewolf was one of the locals who could transform. On the other hand, as I understood it, None of the residents had been harmed by him. And who was this guy, I asked. He's the owner of the mining site, the son of an important official. I see, perhaps the werewolf was attacking local workers and interfering with the excavations. No matter how much this guy shouted, everyone remained silent. Then fists were brought into play. But even then, nobody uttered a word. Soon this man came up to us. He looked closely at me with a brazen look and turning around asked something to his men. They replied with something, after which he asked a question. I didn't understand, but Macau answered. Apparently he didn't like the answer, and Macau got punched in the face. I tried to intervene, but I received a butt stroke to the abdomen which made me double over gasping for breath. We stood at the end of the line when suddenly screams came from somewhere. Several more people were led towards us. They were our colleagues who hadn't been in contact. Apparently they were detained while looking for us. They were beaten, but fortunately not severely injured. They were brought to us and placed beside me. The important guy approached them and started shouting something but the rangers just shrugged, not understanding what was expected of them. Then he stood in front of everyone and angrily yelled something. After that, he pulled out a pistol and loaded it. He walked to the front of the line and, to my horror, shot the guy in the forehead. After the shot, there were cries and the prisoners' wails, and blood spilled on the floor. The guy yelled something again apparently warning that this would happen to everyone. I looked around at the people. They weren't scared, they were angry. 
Macau wanted to rush forward, but I held him back by the hand. It was pointless. Any movement and they would shoot us. The situation seemed hopeless. I started looking around, searching for a way to escape. Nearby, I saw a building guarded by armed men. What were they keeping there? Well, now wasn't the time to be curious. I realized we were trapped, with nowhere to run except for the hangar. There was only one building around and around it, just the step. I turned my attention back to the guy who raised his pistol again and shouted something. I waited for the shot, but then, from beside me came a cry of agony. I turned my head and saw that one of the rangers was bending over, writhing as if he were having convulsions. Then his body began to transform. His hands became covered in fur while he stretched upwards, his limbs elongating and his body enlarging. His head became covered in fur and his face elongated. The creature I had seen earlier began to emerge. Everyone was shocked watching the scene. But then someone snapped out of it and the mercenaries opened fire. I dashed to the side, grabbing Macau. The others did the same. But it seemed the werewolf didn't care. It completed its transformation and at the end lifted its head and howled. Then it leaped at its tormentors. I realized this was our chance and wanted to run. But then I saw Macau leading an old man by the hand. In the chaos, he hadn't forgotten about the others. Damn, it wasn't the time to play the hero. I was about to shout at him, saying let his people take care of the old man, but realized they had scattered. The art of escape? That was it. Those who stood in line seemed to vanish. I looked back. The rangers had also fled. Apparently, everyone took advantage of the moment when attention shifted to the werewolf and escaped. The three of us were left here like fools. The old man was old, so he moved with difficulty. I thought we were about to be shot or devoured by that creature. Running up to him, I hoisted him onto my back and we ran. Getting to the hangar where we were held, we hid inside. The old man began to say something. Macau translated. In short, he asked us to go and stop the curse, or else that creature would destroy the entire savanna. What? Why were we supposed to do that? I peeked outside and saw the creature, towering ten feet tall, simply crushing opponents who tried to shoot it. It was truly a bloody scene. Macau said he agreed to help. Damn, I couldn't abandon this kid. I asked what needed to be done. The old man pointed to the building, which was guarded, of course. Although there was no one at the entrance now, the guards either ran away or were fighting. Then he said to turn the wheel. So, what about the wheel? But the old man just waved his hand for us to run. I looked around. It seemed like nobody was paying attention to us. The battle had shifted further south. So we dashed towards the building, praying that nobody would shoot us. Approaching the door, I found it was unlocked. Entering inside, we found ourselves near a cave dug into the earth. Apparently, they had built walls and a roof, deciding to conceal the entrance. We headed downwards, grabbing flashlights hanging on the wall. The descent was gradual. At first, there was soft soil underfoot. But the farther we descended, the rockier it became. Soon, it turned into solid rock. I directed the flashlight to the ceiling and noticed a ventilation system. Well, at least we wouldn't suffocate. After some time, the slope turned into a flat surface. We walked, watching our step, illuminating the path with flashlights. After a distance, we discovered shiny glowing minerals on the walls. I didn't know what they were, but perhaps these people were mining them. Soon, the cave began to widen until it formed a dead end. We started to look around and noticed ancient symbols on the walls. Near the wall, we saw a cylindrical structure made of stones. On top of it was a wooden round beam with a wheel resembling a ship's helm. 
Below them, various symbols were drawn on the stones. So that's what needed to be turned. We circled around this structure, studying what was depicted there. I was about to try turning it when I heard a gunshot. A bullet whizzed by me. A small hole appeared on the wall nearby. I turned around in fear and saw that unpleasant lad. He grinned horribly and shouted something in his language. What did he want? It turned out he was asking what we were doing there and ordered us not to move. We tried to explain to him that we wanted to stop that creature, but apparently he didn't believe us. With a gesture, he motioned for us to step back. So, obediently, raising our hands, we began to move in the opposite direction. Suddenly, Macaw stopped. I bumped into him, and that rich kid yelled at us to keep going, but then I followed my friend's gaze and saw red eyes glowing behind that lad. Oh God, it seems we got into trouble. The lad couldn't understand why we were staring at him, but suddenly realized that we were looking behind him, not at him. Trembling, he slowly turned around, when in an instant a huge mouth emerged from the darkness and ripped his head off. A fountain of blood sprayed and we watched with empty eyes, feeling like I was going to be sick. Then Macaw came to his senses first and grabbing my hand hurried to the wheel. Honestly, I didn't believe we would survive. Just by spinning it, we could lift the curse, couldn't we? But on the other hand, that creature was staring at us and we didn't really have a choice. I ran after Macau, who was already trying to turn it. It wouldn't budge. Damn, I glanced at the werewolf. It seemed interested in us. I helped my friend but the wheel seemed stuck. I looked back again and saw that the creature was leaping towards us. Stand. Turn it the other way. And miraculously, the wheel turned. There was a flash of light and I closed my eyes lying on the ground, expecting to be torn apart any second. But there was silence. So what's the matter? I raised my head, then stood up and aimed the flashlight towards the exit. On the floor, I saw a naked man lying not far from us. It seemed to have worked. Macau and I approached him and checked his pulse. He was alive. Then we lifted him and dragged him to the surface. I was somewhat afraid he would turn into that creature again, especially when we passed by the remains of that lad. When we emerged, we found no one, and it took us some time to call the authorities. This place was cordoned off, and we were interrogated for a long time. Then Jack and our embassy got busy, so I was soon released. Did I finish the job? No. What I went through was a heavy memory, and I needed a break. Besides, Jack advised me to leave as retaliation from the relatives of that rich kid could be expected. What happened to the lad who turned into a werewolf, I don't know. Before leaving, I said goodbye to Macaw, who had become very close to me and invited him to visit. He promised to try to come. After that, we often exchanged messages. As far as I know, the Maasai tribe returned to their homeland and continued their quiet and peaceful life. What happened to that mysterious cave is unknown to me. But I hope nothing bad will happen in the future.